Hello, in this video we're going to discuss five SVA coding guidelines which hopefully is going to save you a lot of time, effort and frustration. It is important when writing properties that we make them as abstract as possible. Don't go and look at the RTL implementation and then just copy that in SVA. Properties should be created from the specification using the implementation, not the other way around. If we were to look at the code example here, you notice that the property is just replicated exactly what the RTL says. So a question to ask ourselves is here is what do we think we're proving? How would the property ever fail given what we see in front of us? The property should be defined at the verification planning stage. So the questions that we need to answer with the properties we write is what are we testing? How are we going to test it? What stimulus do we need? How do we know that we've tested everything that we need to? How are we going to verify the results are correct? One very important thing to remember is that assertion languages are very precise. That means that they are completely unambiguous and they have to be because all assertion languages, whether it be SVA or any of the other ones, all came from a formal verification background. And formal verification is mathematical proofs. Things to be wary of when you're describing properties is you might describe some assertions that are redundant. The three properties you can see here, OC1, OC2, OC3. Now, what the bubble point says here is that if OC1 and OC2 fail, then so will OC3. So this isn't the same thing as saying we could just delete OC3 because it's not telling us anything we wouldn't know otherwise. But the point it's trying to make here is think about your properties not just only in isolation, although that is how formal verification treats things. Think of the whole totality of what you've described. So think to yourself, are OC1 and OC2 sufficient in order to identify all bad behavior of the design? And you might find that OC3 no longer has a purpose. Okay, so this will be design dependent and require design knowledge. Another thing to be wary of is that assertions, and note I said assertions, and not properties here, because you don't get the same effect with assumptions can be written and they contradict. So con1 and con2 are both properties saying not A and not B should always be true every cycle. However, we've gone and written this property con3 which says A or B must always be true every cycle. So clearly, not all of them can be true all of the time. Now the compiler doesn't detect this. It's not gonna tell you, by the way, did you realize you described conflicting properties? It won't do that. If you're using formal verification and these were assumptions and not assertions, then there is something known as a vacuity check, which does detect this. Another thing to be careful of when you first start writing assertions is under specifying what checks you need doing. If we take the waveforms we can see here, rec, busy and ack, following one cycle after the other, we've seen how we can describe a sequence which represents that, and that's shown here. However, the behavior described by that sequence can be satisfied in more than just the way we saw initially. So this sequence would also satisfy that. So notice on the cycle one where rec occurs, we're saying nothing at all about what Busy and Ack are doing. And this is another way in which we could meet the behavior required by that sequence. So notice on the cycle we're checking for Busy, we're not saying anything about what rec or Ack are doing. And here's another example here, you know, if rec, busy and act were all stuck at logic one, the behavior required by that sequence is always met all of the time. So we have to be sure that we specify everything we want checking, because if we don't specify it, then it won't be checked. Now, a different problem we can have is that we can create some properties which never need to complete. So we define behavior that the syntax rules of the language don't require ever happens. And one way of doing this is with the dollar repetition operator. So this property we can say here says if we have go, this implies that I have the sequence A followed by between two and an infinite number of cycles followed by B. Now infinity just means exactly that. So what that means then is that we'd never require B to actually occur. When we finish a simulation, then we can get the tool to indicate to us there are properties that have not completed yet. So make sure you check your log files and check your simulator settings that apply to this. In the demonstration that you'll see later on in this course, we will show you how you do that in the cadence simulator. We can also see how this property here, uh, go1 implies not busy, occurs consecutively 
between one and an infinite number of times followed by busy this doesn't require busy to occur either for the same reason exactly so how do we get around this well what we can do is we can add things which actually constrain the sequence not to be of infinite length anymore so we can use disable if if for example intersect within those sequence operators we discussed earlier what we've got an example of now is go one what we're doing is we're intersecting that with nine consecutive occurrences of one tick b1 so basically this part of this subsequence here which says not busy repeated one to eight times followed one cycle later by busy must complete within nine cycles now having said all of that still be aware that some properties may actually be open-ended and that's exactly what you want and need so remember, in simulation, there is not such thing as infinity. In formal verification, you can verify things to infinity. We will now discuss how fulfilling conditions and enabling conditions are treated differently by the assertion language. So what we have an example of here is a property where the enabling sequence is S followed one cycle later by T. And if we observe that sequence, then what this implies from the next cycle is that we see one of the two alternative sequences shown which is seven consecutive repetitions of L or we see the sequence J followed one cycle later by two non-consecutive repetitions of K so a property will pass whenever the first and shortest pattern matching the fulfilling condition is observed okay and then it becomes inactive because it's come to a conclusion which is pass or fail Given these waveforms here then, so on cycle 2 is when our enabling sequence S followed by T is completed. From the next cycle we require either L consecutively 7 times or we require J followed by 2 non-consecutive occurrences of K. So on cycle 3 we have uh, L being true and J being true as well. And following J on cycle 5 we have one occurrence of K and on 8 we have the second occurrence of K so at that cycle there 8 our assertion will pass if you remember back to our discussion on non-consecutive repetition that equals 2 was true from the second occurrence all the way up until the third occurrence of K however that's irrelevant for us in regard of a pass because we have already seen the shortest pattern that will match that behavior on here at cycle 8 the assertion will pass because we've had two occurrences of K. Now, because L went high at cycle 3 and it remains high until cycle 9, that doesn't indicate another pass of the property because the property has already been made inactive because it's passed. It doesn't matter to us. It has no effect at all on the simulation that we had seven consecutive occurrences of L. To show how enabling conditions are treated differently, we will now switch the left and right hand sides of the implication operator. What we've got now as the enabling condition is the open-ended sequence J followed next cycle by two non-consecutive occurrences of K. If we observe that sequence, or any neg edge at which we observe that sequence being true, we require the sequence S followed by T or the assertion will fail. So one very essential thing to understand here is that every cycle at which the enabling condition has been observed requires the fulfilling condition. And if we look at the waveform diagram now, at cycle 1 we have J. At cycle 2 we have the first of the two non-consecutive occurrences of K. At 5 we have second of the two non-consecutive occurrences of K. So what we mean is our property now is enabled from cycle 5 all the way up until the third occurrence of K. So on this set of waveforms, that is at cycle 8. So if we were to look at this another way, our property is enabled at cycle 5, requiring on the next cycle S followed by T. And it's also enabled at 6, requiring S followed by T on the next cycle. And it's also enabled on 7, requiring S followed by T on the next cycle. The only time we actually observe S followed by T, our required fulfilling condition is starting from cycle 6 so cycle 6 and cycle 7 the assertion which got enabled at cycle 5 passes at cycle 7 however as our property also got enabled at cycle 6 and there isn't an S present at cycle 7 that one will fail 
and also we're enabling the property again at cycle 7. So you can see the same property, the same code actually, at cycle 7, there are three copies of that property or three different threads running all at different stages of completion and they're indicating pass, fail and enabled. We will also observe a failure at cycle 8 because we enable the property again at cycle 7. This is symptomatic of describing properties where it's getting enabled more times than you desire. Okay, and We need to debug this kind of situation and be careful that we don't describe open-ended enabling conditions in a way such as this. On this set of waveforms here, three fulfilling conditions are required, which probably isn't our intention. So a typical way you realize this is you see the assertion pass as expected on cycle 7, but you also see it fail at cycle 7, and you also see it fail at cycle 8. To summarize what we've seen over the last two slides, showing the difference between how fulfilling conditions and enabling conditions are treated, for enabling conditions, then every time the left-hand side of implication occurs, we require the right-hand side of implication. So if you have an open-ended sequence, that's probably more times than we really intended. If we have open-ended sequences on the right-hand side of implication, however, as a fulfilling condition, then the earliest opportunity at which behavior observed matches the behavior required by the property results in the property either passing or failing and then becoming inactive. And the final tip is to make use of auxiliary code. Every time you hear the word check, it doesn't mean you have to implement something with SVA alone. Auxiliary code can greatly simplify the evaluation of properties, making it more effective in terms of the tool will give you a result in a quicker time. In addition to that, try and make sure that your properties are sampled as infrequently as possible. One example of how to do that is shown in this clocking expression here. So this clocking expression at posedge clock, we're qualifying this using the system Verilog IFF operator. So only posedge clocks at which valid are true are considered in the valuation of this property. So when we say next cycle or one cycle delay, cycle means a pause edge of a clock where valid was true. So this can greatly simplify the evaluation of properties and how you describe them. So examples of using auxiliary code, and again this is functionally correct, but being functionally correct is not good enough. Just like in synthesis, you know, having the correct RTL design is not good enough, it has to be efficient for synthesis as well. So it's perfectly fine saying this, you know, every pause edge clock C is greater than A plus B, but what you're requiring the tool to do is, and remember, it is possible that we have overlapping assertions as well, so even one property might generate more than one requirement to do this calculation every cycle. So it can be compounded by overlapping properties. So we've got a magnitude comparison here, which is slow, and an addition here, which is going to be slow. So what we can do instead is use auxiliary code. So this is just normal RTL code that's there for verification purposes only to make it easier for the tool to evaluate the property. And what we have is two wires indicating A plus B and C is greater than A plus B. So obviously these expressions will only be evaluated when anything on the right hand side changes, the right hand side of the assignment operator. So that gets sampled by the tool as infrequently as it is possible to do. So this helps us. So once we have these signals here, you know, we've got this one wire here that is replacing that entire expression. So all the tool needs to do now every cycle is check the state of this boolean. You know, is it true or is it false? And the calculations only get done when they need to get done. It's not good enough that you're functionally correct. You have to be efficient as well. Right, so I hope those tips manage to save you some time in the future. And thank you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>